about what we have seen this morning. But I'm first going to do something which Ken has not asked me to do. I'm going to ask everyone to move forward because there's a center of, the center of gravity in this room is somewhere towards the back of the room. And it's rather difficult to get a conversation or a forum <laughs> with a center of gravity like that. Could those at the back move forward, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> We've had an interesting review this whole day where we started in Singapore with the presentation um, by Jeff on horizon scanners, which was essentially a mobile tour of Singapore, Singapore seen from the back of a Saab, as far as I could tell. <laughs> right. And then we went on from that um, to a tour of Malaysia, where we were introduced by Bernice to the Wayang Kulit puppet or shadow play, which led it into a discussion about facades, elevations, and the nature of light and shadow in the interpretation and experience of um, the, built, the built world. And we <coughs> went from that this afternoon to an astonishing whirlwind tour of Korea. It was uh, career in 15 minutes, which just left me breathless by uh, Lee Young Suk. <laughs> and then a couple of presentations on aspects of Korean architecture and design uh, from Min, Min Soon Jo and uh, Kim Yong Si. Then we went quickly through Australia with Mick's presentation tying together a history, a brief history of the AA in Australia, and ended now with a provocative presentation from Thailand by Duong Grip. I'll start with the last one, just as a statement, to try and provoke some discussion. The, pr the presentation at the end concluded with a statement, essentially. Architecture is of your making. It, architecture is of your making through your experience. The architect is there simply to give you a vehicle to have an experience, if that's a fair summary. Very interesting comment to end with on the, at the uh, end of a first day of discussion about architecture. The role of the architect is simply there to give you, you personally, something to experience. I would like to ask if there's anyone in the floor who's willing to pick up that challenge and run with it and see. <coughs> Do you take that statement and if you do, how do you interpret that statement as an architect? As somebody, either as a student here who's engaged in learning how to be an architect, or you as an architect, how would you interpret that statement? You left them speechless. <laughs> you, are, you succeeded. <laughs> I might want to say something. Please. Um, I actually just graduated from same program that you did. The previously was 2DG. Just graduated two months ago from DRL. Um, just wanted to do that. I think the way we are educated is a lot. There's a lot of ego and what do the architects want uh, with our self-consciousness uh, towards uh, sensibility towards the environment. Uh, but from your work, it's. Um, I would like to also raise the issue of. Um, compromising uh, how does the AA uh, content uploaded to you is being compromised in the uh, context of Asia. Um, so far that from today's uh, presentation it seems uh, there's a lot of ways uh, taking back to the traditional roots either or climatic as well. Uh, it's also another issue I would like to
what you learn from this school is, is, is something outstanding. They, they don't actually teach you anything, but, uh, you, you, they <laughs> <laughs> but they implant some kind of, you know, powerful seed within yourself, and then you let it grow, okay, wherever you go. I go back to Thailand, I let it grow in, in the context of Thailand, and it's evolved. It's not compromising. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's we are compromising on, on the design aspect or on the theoretical part of the, of the project that we're doing, but uh, we let it evolve, and it evolved within the context. So the context is different from here. You know, it, you, you work in London, it's, it's totally different context. But if you work in Thailand, the contract is, you know, is absurd. I mean, it's they're crazy there, okay? So I mean, the, the way that the, the, the theoretical thinking grow in that country should be different, and, and it must be different. And it's, is evolving, not compromising, and I, I, I objected to that comment. That's Jeff, Jeff. Uh, I was actually going to ask you to pick up on that, um, because... <laughs> no, in, I was going to say this, sorry, go ahead. In, in your presentation this morning, you, you took us through a, a whole range of architectures in Singapore. One of the things that came across in that was, I thought, was the angst of self-discovery. Here's this little nation that's struggling to define itself, and the architecture was reflecting that self-discovery. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is this term Asia, it's, there's not one thing there. Every country is different. I mean, the difference between, say, Singapore and Thailand is, you know, could be the same as between the UK and the US, you know, because the populations vary. Singapore's got four million. Indonesia's got, what, 240 million or 120 million. And each of these countries addresses their problems in different ways. And as a result, I think the architecture differs or the way it's practiced. Um, but with um, Singapore, and I think at the beginning that we were making a statement is um, Singapore's a very young country. I mean, if you look at Thailand, it's got a monarchy, it's never been colonized, and that sort of thing. So it's had a long history. Singapore's only had 40 years of independence, which is more than Australia's had, because it's... <laughs> 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 um, and, um, and it's coming to grips with this identity, and it's emerging from a you know, very Confucian society to a si society where the young are uh, influenced by the internet, MTV, and everything else from the West. And um, it's, it is this struggle of identity and also of a certain repression there. But I think in some ways it's not a bad thing because at least they've got something to discover. Well, we've got something to discover there. And I think, and people are discovering it in different ways, which is why you've got all these different variations on architecture and theater and filmmaking that's becoming, you know, part of the culture or, or a developing culture. I think I've done my dash. Anybody in the audience care to pick that up? Thank you. I, I think it's very interesting um, this morning to see the, um, the Singapore um, pictures. But, um, my question is, um, it's it's weird for me because I have been to Singapore before, and the city give me the impression is uh, it's very clean and very ordered. Is that you know that kind of um, lack of identity, that kind um, of of sense. But um, but this morning when I see this um, documentary that you showed to us, and uh, it shows that the Singapore has another kind of variety, and and this variety. It, to me, it's quite. I, I'm not sure. It's it, it's kind of alternative of Singapore, or is the frame or perspective that you show us, which is um, which is you interesting, or from the Western point of view, um, that you want to show what you are interesting, rather than um, rather than the city in its own way. Um, I think <laughs> you, you got what I mean. Yeah, I think, uh, you've seen the Singapore Tourism Board's version of Singapore. 
we're showing the underbelly, which existed. <laughs> um, and um, we did apply for funding for this film, and we didn't get anything. Uh, but I think, um, I mean, there's a lot more people out there that we could have interviewed doing similar sort of things. I mean, we had a list of initially of about 40 people and we sort of whittled it down to the numbers. But, I mean, all these things are happening in Singapore. You do have this one level. I mean, I like to think of it... Um, there's a guy called um, Freeman Dyson who's uh, emeritus professor of national science, natural sciences at, I think, Princeton. He wrote a book called Imagine Worlds, and in it he describes two structures which can apply to companies, that can apply to countries and that. One's the Napoleonic vision of it, which is very structured, very organized and that. Um, the other model is the Tolstoy version, which is disorganized, chaotic, and very haphazard. Then he describes it in terms of two projects in Switzerland. Uh, these were science projects. One, I think, was CERN, which is a super collider thing which costs hundreds of millions of dollars. The, um, the second one was the IBM laboratories outside of, um, outside of Zurich. They developed the electron scanning tunneling microscope. Now, when you look at and, uh, the CERN one, very structured, very organized. IBM, totally chaotic people came and went and all that sort of thing. And <clears throat> when you um, look at the results in terms of, I suppose, benefit to mankind or the future of science for mankind, the CERN, the super collider, sure there were benefits coming out of it. But with the scanning tunneling microscope, what you could do was see an atom for the first time. And that brought the whole technology of nan or nanotechnology into being and the things that are starting to happen from that. I mean, in the long-term vision of science, I think it's going to be more important than what was achieved by CERN. And, you know, it's this sort of chaotic background and that applies to Singapore. You've got a very much structured Napoleonic society. But then, you know, the guys we were talking to, they're part of this Tolstoy model that they work on in very chaotic situations. The reasons why a lot of the images weren't terribly good is because it's hard to get it out of these guys because they're not organized a lot of the time. And, um, <clears throat> and I think we're showing that sort of size Singapore, which I think is probably the mo more interesting side of the development. Does that answer the question? <laughs> okay. uh, but all, you know, and sometimes with a slightly repressed society, there's more interesting things developed from it. Could I pass the microphone over to Paul Hayat, who would like to extend this? Thank you. Could I, could I begin by asking you a question? Could you repeat the proposition from our last speaker that you began your introduction with? The, the proposition was that architecture is created for you, the, the occupant, to ex develop your experience of architecture. Right. I thought that's what you said. Um, that, that, that's, I think, extraordinarily bold and difficult proposition to deal with. And I just happened to be reading the biography of John Adams, who was the second president of the United States, uh, who... I'm sure Mr. Bush wouldn't like to accept this, but was in fact a terrorist because at that time the United States didn't have independence and he was negotiating with the French to provide gunpowder, etc., etc., and would have been hanged if caught. But nevertheless, he's gone down in history quite rightfully as a, a great leader and uh, a wonderful contributor to you know, that, that marvelous nation's progress. But the interesting thing about him was he also wrote the Constitution for Massachusetts, and in that constitution, he incorporated the obligation of the state to educate the public. And it's a very rare thing to have a constitution that produces an obligation on the state to educate. And the thing that interests me about the proposition that was just made is that it requires a level of individual and collective knowledge because you can't make your own experience of architecture if you have no, no intelligence of or sensibility towards. And of course, if we look at the architecture 
in this country at the moment, we see wonderful examples of very stimulating um, um, uh, efforts, but also we see a rash of house building across the country which is shameful in the extreme and addresses no worthy agenda and produces nothing worthy. And I think that the thing that interests me about the last speaker's um, contribution was just to, to look at the level of ambition that lay within the projects and to acknowledge that somewhere there had to be an ambition amongst those who were instructing these projects as well, otherwise they would have never come to be realized. And beyond that, there has to be a level of perception and enjoyment and appreciation amongst others who will see those projects and be stimulated to return to that architect or similar architects to produce more work. And I think that this is a great worry for us in essentially consumer-based societies, which is to look at where the ambition lies, how well informed that ambition is, who has the power, who has the money, who can actually promote work of what kind. I think architecture has a great difficulty in actually getting the message of its potential worth across to an ex increasingly crude society. Thank you. That's a very good um, summary of, I think, one of the problems about discussing the nature of architecture in Asia. For a start, many Asian languages do not have the word architecture in them. In Chinese, for example, the word is the same as building and there's no differentiation and distinction as we would put in the English language on the nature of architecture as opposed to the nature of building. So the, the, in talk, discussing the role of architecture in a, a culture, you have to recognize that there may not be the tools for discussing that particular concept, and you may have to evolve different tools for it. I think it was in, this, in the presentation um, on Korea, uh, Young Sook Lee talked about, in one of your flashes up there, I was trying to read all the words as fast as I could. You talked about one designer who works in a town where in Korea you have a particular kind of contractor, constructor who just builds lots of buildings. And that architect cannot find, cannot find work because everybody goes to the builder who provides a certain level of um, enclosure, defense from the environment, which doesn't, the architect is not needed in, uh, to provide that. And it was actually, I think, um, Kwad Lim who, who said this, really employed this morning. One of the roles here was the, the nature of storytelling, the importance of storytelling. And if it's, a, if it's a building without storytelling, then what is it? And that was, the, I thought, the, the message that came out of the discussion about uh, the way I'm cool it, the, the fact that you're playing with shadows in order to tell a story, not simply to keep the rain out, not simply to stop the wind from blowing. In, 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 I don't know what was in Ken's mind when he organized this, but in organizing something about a, uh, Asia and architecture, you must be provoking somehow that discussion, I would have thought. <laughs> what is the nature of architecture in Asia? And it should, just, should it be a blind adoption of what we see as being the discourse of architecture in in England or in America, or should it be an, a reinterpreted discourse, mean what the nature of that architecture, and therefore really what are we talking about here in these two days? I don't know, Mick, you, you come from a place that might be a starting point for such a discussion. <clears throat> I'm starting to fade as I've been on the, you know, with the flight, one of the longest flights you can get on in the world, um, um, and it's about four o'clock in the morning for me, so I'm starting to pay it, seriously. But it, it seems to me, and, and I absolutely uh, agree with Jeff's point, that a Asia is not homogenous. It is a kind of exciting set of parallel opportunities, realities, different cultures, and that came out today, quite different places. But some of the problems are similar in that the, the way you have to move fast, you have to think fast, the place is being built fast. Identities are being shaped quickly. People are reassessing their position. And there's a pragmatic edge. It, it, the, the, your kind of um, sense of being ruffled by the word compromise, it's not so much compromise, but there's a pragmatic cultural shift to get things done. And the, the one thing, um, Jeffrey Bauer also said the AA didn't teach you anything. Uh, he, he actually said to me, he said, my, he said something like, 
Michael, it's a wonderful school. It does nothing to impede the worst people, and it does nothing to improve the best. But the, 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 the one thing that the AA does do in quite an exemplary way, and the thing that I've carried throughout the whole of my life and tried to contribute to my students, is the importance of ideas. And that, the idea that you work with has to be, it may not be understood, but it has, you have to get people you have to bring them to an understanding, or you have to judge the idea and communicate it in a way as it does touch a nerve somewhere so it can, it can get things done. And somebody has to help you. You have to work with others in order to get really good ideas built um, for, for the wider understanding. So it, that, that importance of the idea, if you understand how powerful that can be, then you can use the pragmatic process. And that's exciting, and that really is exciting. You can get major things done. And um, the nature of the problems are quite different, but people work in similar ways, and they respond to leadership through ideas. And I think that's one, one thing that shines out from the AA and its graduates. Well, you do, yeah, you do. That enters one of the great discourses of modern education is, yeah. can you teach anything? No, but you can learn a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's, there have been several comments now about the, the, the distinction between Asia and elsewhere. We use the term Asia to differentiate the geographic location as being different from other geographic locations. It's a convenient handle. One of the things that is very interesting about that part of the world it is deeply ancient. It's probably one of the most ancient continuous civilizations uh, or a series of civilizations in the world. And yet, it is intensely new. Things are changing so fast there that what we are doing today is um, something which was not thought of last year and was not even, in, was wholly inconceivable 10 years ago. So the speed of change is dramatic, and that just differentiates it enormously from discussions about de development and architecture elsewhere. One of the things I was very struck by, though, in the presentations today was a constant reference to all other cultural activities, more so than I perhaps would have heard in a presentation about architecture in North America, architecture in Canada, architecture in Germany. Here, today, we saw puppet theater, we saw typography, fashion, uh, product design, and in fact some of the more intense design discussions are perhaps being held in those fields rather than in architecture yes. itself. Was anyone else struck by that? And if they were, <laughs> perhaps could you give some reflection on that or, or tell us how you might interpret that? Asia, but I thought Asia was bigger than the, the list of countries that I've got down here. I mean, I flew over Russia the other day, and I went all the way across Poland, and right the way across Russia, right the way across Siberia, and down to Japan. And vast land masses. Why is it that this energy, and I think if anybody was to draw up a list of where, where it's happening, I mean, I, I hope I haven't said anything that would offend anybody here, but I think that the places where the interesting things are happening are in exactly this list of places that you've got down here. And why is it always that we find so much energy closer to the sea? Because, you know, it's the same in Europe. I mean, the, the, the big activities took place at the fringes of Europe close to the sea. And of course, that's the trading, exchange of ideas, etc., etc. I don't think we should forget the large land masses. When we, we, we can't sit here and talk about Asia and then not even acknowledge that there's a, a huge, un, you know, unrepresented group people with vast cities. I mean, I've flew over Russia and, you know, how many people can name more than three cities in Russia? <laughs> you know, we all know about St. Petersburg and we all know about Leningrad, but that's the same place. And then there's Moscow, but who else can name? I mean, there's 50, 60 major cities in Russia. And nobody can name them. And yet we can all name cities throughout Europe, Australia. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Could I ask, um, so you'd mean to pick up on that perhaps, why, why is it from your perspective, do you think, in Korea, that what you talked about was heavily influenced by all these other design cultures? Why personally is 
is that so important to you? The, the, all the foreign influences? The influences from, from other design cultures beyond architecture. Um, actually, uh, I, I just found out that uh, from you that uh, today there were more uh, design uh, uh, explanation uh, in other fields than the architecture. <laughs> and um, one thing that I, I never thought about it before, but one thing that I just uh, uh, remember is um, compared to other field of design, architecture is the most retard, retarded, retardist area that we are still striving for, struggling for the perfection when we compare to the the Mr. Kim Young says product that he is beyond the perfection and he is going forward for the more uh, making different taste or the di more different designs he already left and uh, <laughs> so and then uh, by this time of uh, this uh, trends or the the century or uh, that uh, we have already uh, exhausted uh, of all the forms that we, we are struggling to achieve, that we have seen most of the forms that uh, we can make until now. So uh, from on that, we are looking for the more interesting issues from outside of the design than the design itself. And I'm uh, trying to get it from the people or the society or the urban issues so uh, compared to other design field that we rather than uh, talking about our product itself, we always have to explain something else. And, um, and then from also one thing that I want to add on is the, the answer to your first question uh, when in the beginning of this forum is that uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Rafael Moneo, uh, he gave a lecture in the uh, title was the building stands alone. So um, no matter what we want to explain about our building, the building uh, stands there by itself even after we die. And uh, so it's more of the, the people experience, experiencing that uh, space. And uh, the way that I design is rather than thinking of myself as a designer for the, the building, I imagine myself as one of the visitor to the building. And I try to, it's almost like a running a film of myself going into the space in different uh, situation of the different people. Sometimes I become a husband, sometimes I become the uh, maid of the house. And uh, so I try to look fit the space onto that person and then eventually the I disappear and then the building stands alone and with a lot of people visiting the space. Um, sorry. Um, regarding to your uh, <coughs> presentation before, uh, there's this something that's quite unique from Asia as well is that you capture it in Korea, there's a lot of rooms for... Uh, I think that, that bit was very interesting for me. Uh, how eventful spaces just occurred and how it is ac accom accommodated. And these are actually something that is quite rich in Southeast Asia places like Singapore or Malaysia. Um, I just find it quite uh, surprising that it's happening the same thing in Korea. And regarding to the industrial design part, I spent my summer working for Roslov Group, which is an industrial designer. She always says to me, you architects always think big. We, s we think small things, we just make beautiful things. But I like the way architects think about context, about uh, picking up ideas from uh, other stuff, such as such eventful spaces. Uh, probably uh, some other architects from this region can talk about that. I was just picking up on, you were saying, why are architects or that doing so many other things as well? I think it's mainly out of frustration there because, 
Uh, there was a survey by the Singapore Institute of Architects which showed that 55% of uh, architects' time was spent on doing government compliances. <laughs> and from my experience, it's tr probably 65%. And it's also with, uh, it's so restrictive. You're basically designing in concrete. There's no way you could ever design some of those lightweight structures that you saw in, in Australia, for example. And, you know, you feel like you've got to do something else just to relieve that frustration. <laughs> The question of whether the architect is uh, as much a designer or a town planner, the, the differentiation of how to demarcate the line between when the architect plays the role as a town planner or a guy who actually understands regulations and when he becomes uh, an artist, i.e. he defines shape, form, select material. It's a very interesting question because more and more, in, in my experience working with a lot of, when you collaborate with um, firms you know, internationally, what you get is that you don't actually try, you try to blur the line between the, your role as a lead consultant and the guy who designs light fittings, for example, for your facade. So it's interesting, like in Korea, the, 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 the guy who does all these so-called small, small projects, his role as a designer is more significant, and it's sort of intense uh, uh, sort of uh, involvement with the product. I think we architects should wear the hat of, like, you know, Treating our buildings as products so that we are actually uh, seen as if we 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 give forms to our buildings, so that we differentiate the difference between the practice of architecture or design against uh, the engineer, with no disrespect to the profession, uh, who generates just solutions to hold up a building, i.e., engineering uh, problems or you know uh, irrigation problems, uh, infrastructure. So I think the architect should actually be a, a product designer. In other words, architecture is no longer a service. It should be an art form. In, a, in the sense that um, as an architect, you, you, you position yourself. And egoistic it might sound to be, but you have to do that in order to differentiate the, the functions. You know? So product design and architecture is actually, I think, I see them to be relatives, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not a school of architecture, it's a school of design, because the, you blur your role as a, as a light consultant, as a sound consultant, as an art director in a, in a project, such as a retail project, or a facade consultant, and the architect has the, a very wide uh, knowledge, a uh, very uh, sort of expansive knowledge of the various disciplines. So in, in a sense, the, the end product is actually is, is the piece of art, you know, it's no longer a service. It's, it's not, uh, you're not, you're no longer the guy who tells you, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not taking off the book. You're not, you're not working uh, with a bidding regulation document. You're actually uh, an artist. Um, I, I like to um, respond to a few um, issues that was brought up. Uh, number one is, um, uh, what does a school does to uh, a student? Uh, for me, I think the most valuable things that uh, a school has uh, done to me as an architect, uh, apart from learning the basics, uh, is to teach you how to think and how to analyze in developing your career when you, after you leave your school. I think um, what we're talking about a lot uh, just now uh, is uh, to be able to uh, have an idea that you pursue when you design anything. Now, ideas can come from... Uh, I don't think ideas can just come like that. I think a lot of time, or well, in our practice anyway, uh, ideas come from a thorough uh, investigation, uh, analyze, and uh, having understanding what the real issues uh, uh, is about. Uh, that we're pursuing for that particular project. And uh, that kind of ideas you, we found are uh, usually uh, the most valuable one. And then after that is a matter of how to realize that idea and, and not lose the big picture as you go along and develop a project and executing it. Of course, in, 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 in our country, in our environment, we face a lot of different kind of uh, challenges in realizing that. 
And the other thing is um, uh, the, the issues of Asian identity. I, I think it's something that is very, very difficult to define, especially in today's uh, uh, world. Uh, everything is so fast, uh, so well connected. It's very difficult to say what is the nation identity, and I think that's not what we're trying to pursue. The, I the, the, the idea of the one collet uh, as um, introduction is, is, I think, to me, the most uh, valid thing is that we as architects are the, the storyteller. That, mean, that means you have an idea behind every piece of work, and you're trying to communicate that idea to the end user or to uh, your fellow uh, to, to, the, to the benefits of the architectural world. So I think <coughs> identity is something that uh, uh, is very difficult for us uh, to define, whether it's Asian or whether it's whatever. I think you, what tends to happen uh, I, is that you, you have an idea um, and then you develop it and in order for, for that thing to, to realize, you have different uh, considerations, usually the regional one, a uh, climatic one, uh, the needs of uh, the particular area, that the, the people who live there, and that tends to evolve with the idea still intact, idea is an idea. And, uh, and, and, and that, in that way, I've, I think uh, uh, works done out of that kind of thing uh, will have its identity, its so-called identity, you know, uh, rather than uh, from the start is trying to define uh, identity of that area, and you start from there, I think it's, it, it ends up with what we see a lot in Asia is uh, borrowed identity, which is happening a lot every day in, in, in our society. You, you just take something, uh, especially in, you know, in for the developer, they say something and then they like it and they say, I want that, you, you, you do it, you know. It's, then it's up to the architect to say, no, this is not the case here, you know, you got to analyze it. it. It cannot be just like that. However, you can reinterpret it, you know, the, 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 the same idea to, to, to suit the, solu the, the problem that they have as a piece of design. So, architect, one of the distinctions of Asia, though, is you are able to invent that as you need to, because there are so many dimensions and facets to, um, to Asia. You want to basically never used to be talking too much because but I actually go to like to your presentation, the last presentation that you've seen. You actually struck me something quite interesting when your with your silence presentation and your final comment saying that creating architecture to be reinterpreted by the user. And that brought to my mind the book by Ronald Bartz, The Death of the Author saying that the literature piece is finished the moment the book is finished because whoever, that is the point where author finished to exist because everybody that reads the book have different interpretation of the reading and it's never as author imagine it. And that in terms brought my memories to being a student here when I couldn't speak any English at that point and I used to put my drawings on the wall and I was able to say this is it. <laughs> and my teacher managed to always reinterpret my work so much better than I could ever <laughs> imagine it. <laughs> Which was a great <laughs> lesson for me to learn <laughs> that you know sometimes a silence presentation could be a very good one. It's, it's fascinating. The, um, the presentations today have, have raised this discussion about what is the role of the architect? It's been this, if the role of the architect is storyteller, but a moment ago, and what's just was raised the, the proposition is actually the store. The role of the architect is a story maker. It's not just telling a story, but inventing the whole story as well. That ties back a little bit to the nature of what architecture is. If you have a clear tradition of architecture, you know what it is. The story you can tell is within that framework. In Asia, as we've said a moment ago, there's no common definition of what the word architect means, there are different interpretations in different languages and in different cultural frameworks of what the role of the architect is. And in fact, the institutions such as the UIA have found this to be a major problem as they go around the world trying to 
identify or accredit architects. For example, you go to Indonesia and there are tens of thousands of people who call themselves architects because anyone can hang up a shingle and say, I'm an architect. You don't need to have gone to any particular school. There are some, there is one institute of architects in Indonesia that's trying to define it and frame it within the Western sense. Yet if anyone, if anyone can be an architect, then anyone can create architecture. And therefore, what is it that we're talking about? Who spins the story and who consumes the story? I think what's coming out, though, in some of this discussion today was that some stories are rich and worth hearing, and other stories, perhaps, are rather, not, are rather mundane and restrictive. The, some buildings allow some, you a new, a new view to your world, a new view to your place in the world or your, your daily existence, and other buildings simply contain what is and perhaps don't do that particularly well. And so that's maybe a distinction that's being told today. What's the quality of the story? What's the quality of the shadow play? How evocative is it? Is there something that's very crucial about creation? Of <laughs> there is something coming up. I just want to spread it on the ground so people can share it with. I think that the first conversation that I usually have with the Asian architect is that we're trying to distinguish difference between Asian architecture and Western architecture, which is something very not quite clever to do because um, we're trying to differentiate ourselves with our culture, with our history whatsoever. And that trying to uh, differentiate ourselves from the universal language of architecture and that is something very, uh, 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 to me, is, is un undesirable to do. If, if you want to go out into the world and want to speak with others, you have to speak with the same language. I mean, and thing that you want to defending or thing that you want to create it should lie within your thinking, not vocabulary. I, I think that, that's something that, that I'm trying to persuade by, by my presentation. Something to just to think about, you know. Um, you, you're speaking before about the difference between Asian and the rest of the world by geo geographical uh, location. But other thing that might be interesting is about the language. The language, the Asian language, I think that make Asian people different from each other. I mean, it make you know, if you if you never know any Japanese and Korean before, you you it's the same alike, you know. But uh, when you speak to them. You know, you know they are different because of the structure of the language are totally different. And I think uh, actually Thai or Malaysian or, or Singapore or you know Vietnam or Cam Cambodia, they all they have different language actually. And uh, the, the language is a part of the uh, of the of the key structure that uh, that, that helps structure the brain. And the brain turn out to be thinking in a different way because of the language uh, as well. So. Part of that is make the, 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 the way we think or the way we approach about architecture is, is diverse within, even in the Asian uh, uh, countries themselves. A very good reminder. I was um, recently reading something that noted that the Korean language is the richest language to describe three-dimensional space. <laughs> <laughs> so Koreans should be able to experience and describe three-dimensional space better than the rest of us. <laughs> I suppose so. I, I have a very close uh, Korean friend, Koru Chun Su, and um, and his his company is called um, From Space Group. Is that right? <laughs> now I said that's a strange name to have for an architect firm. He said, "Well, I used to be a, a senior partner of this firm called the Space Group. So having left this firm, I call call my firm From the Space Group." <laughs> so I said, "I suppose when your partners leave you, you know, they call it the side of the firm called Out of Space." <laughs> But the word space is a very nice word in Korean. But when, when, when you use it in English, it means some, you know, it just means it's much more blander. But I'd like to go back um, to what Andrew said about compromise. And I think maybe compromise isn't the right word. Maybe the word should be adaptation or translation. I think because, um, you see, when you're a student at AA, you know, some students who are lucky, they learn to develop a definitive personal style. 
or they d develop an approach to architecture, or they learn to, to, to have a personal discourse or way of looking, of approaching or, or, or viewing the architecture as a whole. But then when you leave the school, what happens when you go to practice? You know, a good lot of students would you start to work in architectural practices, and you know, and you suddenly find that what you learn at school and what you want to do, um, it, it becomes incredibly difficult because you know you, the, the the real world is very different. And so, you know, even if you start your own practice, then you don't have very much options. You either continue to do uh, teach, or you you do competitions, hoping that you know one of these competitions, uh, you can actually do what you've been you know, trying to do as, as a student. Um, in, in real life, and, and of course, if you win a competition, it's different, but if you don't, then it becomes very demeaning. And so, uh, in many ways, um, the, the, the process, the, 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 the angst, the translation from the time you leave the school and, and to try and do what you want, I think, is one of the, in the biggest tragedies, I think, of, of coming to the AA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to add on to. Um, the story making and also the compromising work is that um, uh, I, I was the one who wrote about the local builders and local design offices. And um, one of the problem in our uh, uh, region is that whenever you walk out of your house and there are a series of different, um, different kinds of contractors, who is uh, like a carpenter, and then the right next door is a metal worker, and then they all uh, say that uh, window makers, they're all saying they can build the whole house. So if you go out and then just uh, order, uh, go visit one of these uh, like contractors and then order them, then they, even though one person is a metal worker, he can do all different kinds of things, electrical work and everything. And so when I, I meet these clients and then they are telling me that uh, I already have designed few houses before. So they think they are all designers. So this story making and storytelling is uh, as in uh, Wayang Kulit, that we have all this collaboration of story making. <laughs> the, the client and clients, family, relatives, and me, and um, anybody who walks by the, the the construction site. So at the end, th there is this uh, story coming out of from many different people and then uh, comes into one story. And then after that, it's also translated in, in all different ways. And I once had an interview on TV and I had my client to get the interview and then she was saying that she designed the whole building. <laughs> so, so it's, it's like uh, the, we make the story uh, all together and then we uh, talk about the story all together in different ways. Which is a very Asian perspe perspective, I think, is that one does things collectively that distinction. Um, I have a few questions uh, that's running through my head um, listening to, to today's forum. But I think um, coming back to the um, question of storytelling, I find it a bit weird because um, in a way it's the architects who are telling the story, not the building. So that's one I find uh, quite paralyzing. Uh, I, I, I find it non-operative non at all. But of course, uh, the lead-on question or the larger question that I want to, to bring up is that um, a good example I can give is the, um, is the movie Apocalypse Now, whereby um, um, one begins uh, the character of Michael Doug uh, Kirk Douglas, uh, w went on to Vietnam and he was asked to look for this crazy general, apparently trained, uh, very highly trained, but somewhat has developed or has mutated uh, a, a way of conducting the war which in a, w uh, which in a way borrows uh, from uh, the battlefield in which he, he operated uh, in those few years. And of course in, in, in the movie what was, what, what was so intriguing is to, to actually um, witness this mutation of uh, a conventional warfare which was created in, uh, or which was uh, uh, where this general was trained in the US and in which to see how, how that has uh, mutated to something extremely effective in terms of its operativity 
um, in the in the actual battlefield condition. So the question that I'm asking is that if we if we as a graduates uh, leave the school with a certain theoretical genes that we carry, and here we go back to Asia to in in a way to operate in this very fast paced environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My question is, how does that um, or how does the battlefield or how has the battlefield changed uh, your theoretical genes? Is there a coherent body of knowledge that will inform you theoretically of how to operate within the new battlefield that you're engaging in? Or are we just spinning more stories? <laughs> when you get out of here, if you got a good gene, you will survive. Definitely survive. I thought I'd show you in my presentation. What well, I think it's also very provocative that you talk about battlefields. Architecture is a battlefield frames the discussion in a particular manner where what has been talked about in, pre in other descriptions is perhaps architecture as a collaboration rather than a battlefield. Well, you have collaboration in battlefield. So, Lawrence. I'd just like to um, respond to an earlier point that uh, Huat Lim and I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Andrew uh, made about product design because I actually teach at a school that um, covers both um, built environment design and product design and we always fight, the tutors always fight, the people who are teaching built environment and product designers always fight, because, not only because of scale but I think what was clear to me today um, listening to, um, I forgot his name, Yong Se Kim today as a, as a professional product designer is that the golf bag story really struck a nerve. He, he said, I had this whim, I went out, I made a prototype, I spent half a million dollars, it didn't work, okay, it goes in the bin. You know, no, it doesn't really matter. But I think as architects, um, certainly in my training here, and what I understand um, as being uh, good architecture, we're, we're taught to be responsible for the buildings that we put up. For, I think you made the point earlier that buildings do stand up and I um, in thinking that it made me uh, recall a very very enjoyable one of the most enjoyable and memorable lectures I've um, heard here at, at the AA uh, Cedric Price uh, always believed his buildings were disposable he, he very famously said that he believes that uh, all his buildings should be taken down after 15 years, and 25 years, and, and rebuilt again. So, <laughs> and I, th I think this is a, actually a, an attitude which um, is a bit of a problem in Asia because buildings go up so far, cities are built in the, in, in the space of years in, in Asia. How disposable are, are the buildings in Asia? How, you know, how permanent is the architecture that we try to create in Asia? It's, a, it's something that's going through my mind at the moment. I think that's a major, major difference between product designers and, and architects. Product designers design um, a very, very big range of things. They don't always stand up. I mean, uh, uh, it's very often in, in exhibitions that, that we have that the product designer's chair actually falls apart. You know, I actually sat on a on a on a prototype the other day, and it just fell apart. It just collapsed. But that doesn't um, happen very often when architects, you know, make on prototypes. The contrary, I think uh, a lot of buildings fall apart uh, before my pen breaks down. Or, you know, <laughs> can I just say um, this? This we I think product design and architecture I think have uh, share very similar qualities or you know uh, elements of uh, quality. I think. Um, you claim that buildings uh, should be more permanent or, or not? No, I'm saying that that's, that's the traditional education that we have received. That's becoming less and less important. But I think, I think what's get becoming more important that buildings should become uh, a commodity. It's a product, and we should. I mean, I don't know, in previous uh, question about 
you need to differentiate. I think it's probably Ken's uh, motto. You, know, you have to differentiate your product in order that you become identifiable, and that's the definition to what you do. And I think um, in this case, I think uh, the, the product design quality of your building has to be readable and legible. And I think it is very important that we, as architects, as individual practitioners, we define define the product not to the level where it becomes dysfunctional or it becomes a work of art solely, you know. And I think it's very important that the definition cannot be stressed and cannot be made so apart that we forget that differentiation and definition of what we do as architects uh, is very, very important. Thank you. Paul's going to react to that. And Adela will. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to spoil the party on this, but I've been listening to this issue of products again, and I don't think buildings are products. Buildings represent an investment for most people, an investment that increases in value. Most products decrease in value from the moment you buy them. Buildings represent very little investment in terms of development, testing, prototype. Most products involve vast amount of investment in prototype, etc. There's tremendous care in the production of products, especially in producing them efficiently and effectively. Everybody who makes a product says, right now I've invented it, now I've designed it, how can I make it cheaper, faster, better? Architects very rarely look at that agenda in buildings. They get forced to look at it and they don't like it, and they squeal and they scream and because they won't engage in it. Other people do it for them and they value engineer the quality of other buildings. So I think that perhaps if we did look at buildings more as products, we might be we might do better, but it's because we don't that we have so many problems in that area. Second thing I'd like to say is I think that there is an issue of ethics and values which has been lacking in this conversation so far. What are the ethics and what are the values that inform the architecture of a particular country? And the third thing is that I think that um, it's very important to look not so much at the buildings but at the virtual and real infrastructure that, that dictate the form of buildings. And by virtual, I mean land ownership, land ownership patterns, ancient street works. It's not for nothing that number one Poundbury in the centre of London, which is probably one of Stirling's finest works, actually has its shape. The whole form of that building is dictated by ancient land ownership um, patterns and the public ways around the building. And I think that whilst architecture buildings can come and go, the very form of the buildings for centuries to come will be dictated by early and crude decisions on, on land parcel sizes. And this can have a huge and damaging effect, or a good effect on as it is. Thank you. The comment about ethics is, I think, critical. And I was going to raise it, because one of the questions. I'll, I'd love to pick that up after Adela has had her made a comment. Um, actually, Paul has said it pretty much. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say that um, I think product design and architecture design can't be, t I mean, you can't really draw a, a direct parallel between them. But as architects, I think we, we could take more responsibility in designing, um, for example, a retail space as, as an entire package um, and take on more responsibility over areas which we feel that we can, for example, you know, leaflets and menus and things like that. I mean, I mean, <coughs> other consultants can take over that kind of responsibility, but if you feel that we, um, you know, architects are known to be control freaks and there's, there are certain um, limits to what we can do, but what, what we feel that we should do in order to produce an entire package as a product of the design as, as, an, as a totality, then, you know, we have to um, basically take it on board and make, make our, our roles clear when we do that. Um, I mean, actually um, producing with the end product um, in collaborating with other consultants, I think it's also important taking on board what what, um, what was saying. Um, yes, you know, you, you are the lead consultant and, and you deal with other consultants, but in, in order to, to um, get things built your way. I think it's important to define your roles um, and to ensure that the roles, the other consultants are clear about their roles as well. Um, and uh, that, that boils down to, I suppose, experience in practice. And um, in, in it, it takes years <laughs> sometimes to actually understand that um, I'm still new in practice and I still, you know, I, I'm learning 
new lessons in, in terms of what my role is or, or what my role could be in order to actually further our ideas and to kind of make the story clearer or, or make more of a story out of your building. Um, and then taking on what um, I don't know the name so was saying about your uh, the theoretical body, once you leave school, um, kind of what will happen? You know, will you evolve or will you be involved in a in some kind of battle in order to to get your ideas across? Um, I don't think you should lose any part of 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 you or your theoretical body or, or idea because basically, um, without your ideas, you you can't really tell a story, um, and and I think the art of basically um, making the story is a lot to do with having the theoretical body to start with and basically engaging with the processes that's required in order to, to, to um, basically get, get your ideas built. And this is what you probably won't learn in school um, and takes a couple of years in practice to kind of um, get hold of. Um, I don't know whether other other people would agree with me, but you know, it's whether whether or not you take that on board or not. Um, it's a choice. It's hard work, and it, it, it is a battle at the beginning. Um, but you know, it's down to your experience in practice and how you man maintain those ideas and carry those f forth. Um, I think. Okay. I'd like to pick up if I could take the conversation in a slightly different direction from Paul's provocation is the discussion of ethics. Um, I think it might reflect back on a little bit what we've been talking about, but there is a substantial question here um, when we st start talking about Asia. The population in that part of the world is very substantial. The desire for change and increase in comfort levels is very, very substantial, which su suggests that there's an enormous investment in the next few years, the next couple of decades, to change the nature of life in Asia. That implies the nature of life for billions of people. If we continue building the way we're going to build, we are going, going to consume vast amounts comes up in the choice of the way you practice. And the biggest question, I believe, comes up in the question of who you define to be your client. <laughs> which in Asia is a fascinating question. <laughs> so, we're talking about all of this practice of architecture as being storytelling, perhaps, or story making, or battles, or, but we're ignoring it, an enormous, enormous problem dead in front of us, which we can blithely ignore. We can pretend that architecture is the practice of what we know, or we could take the opportunity to redefine it as being the practice of something different. Has anyone heard today, perhaps, a challenge to that? Or does anybody see a, a point to discuss about where things might, might change, especially in education? Jeff. Uh, when you were talking about ethics and morals, and um, you know, if you're talking about sustainability, if you're talking about um, <coughs> similar issues to that, a lot of the time, well, particularly Singapore, which is one of the examples I know, um, it depends on the regulations. And really, because of the regulations, you have to build in traditional concrete. They are more, the regulations make for permanent structures. Even though, as Ben Watt was saying, there's a 40 year cycle and getting and decreasing in turnover of major buildings. And I think. You know, this is the dichotomy. And, I mean, you know, shortage of steel because of the way China's developing. And it's only going to get worse. And, um, I mean, in Australia, you've got things like right of light. You've also got incentives for photovoltaics and all this sort of, sort of thing. It doesn't exist in Asia, but that's where the problem is. And if you want to build, you build to the regulations. If you're going to insist on sustainability in that, you won't get a job. Uh, 
pointing your fingers at me. Um, I, I think it's partly true what you say, but I think it is also the responsibility of the architect to persuade your client to accept things which he have not seen before. But this, this answer actually ties quite a lot of the questions together. Is it a battle? Yes. How convincing are you in winning the battle? It is what you are trained to do. Now, um, when, when we were doing some projects in China, the question of sustainability never come across. But the client is very aware that there are millions of square feet of offices being built around him. How is he going to sustain his business to rent his office for the next 20 years against all those millions of square foot of development coming up? He came up, or we suggested to him, that sustainability, environmentally friendly, building in a different way that you appeal to the people who work in the offices rather than just to make it look like an edifice, is the way to keep it competitive. He bought it. He bought it with a lot of investment because it's not cheap to build it like that. And how do you convince him? The training at the AA does it for you. Because it's, I mean, <laughs> when you are standing in front of a crit while you are at the AA, I tell you, you, t you get torn apart. You are taught to defend your corner. And defending it in such a way that your critic is persuaded by you. Now, this is a very, very interesting thing because um, I was at the AA and I was taught by Bernard Shoutme. And uh, actually, I never thought he was teaching me because we, never, we were always playing around. And uh, one of the things that he said to me was that um, what makes a space, it's not what to define and put a name tag on that room to call it a space. It's what the activities that go in it. And that stuck with my mind all through my um, career, practical years, whatever. And every time when I tell my staff to design a house or design a room, the first thing they draw is four walls. What is that? Sitting room. What is that? Bedroom. Well, tells me, what do you do in these rooms? So the architect being persuasive and being able to argue your case is to let your clients see things differently. And that is what training is about. And I think it is, a, um, uh, it is a storytelling maybe, but how you put um, something very rational, but not in a very boring way, is what gets you through many, many of the projects. And I think sustainability or not, it is the role of the architect to persuade. And that is the ethics that we, I think, as an architect, you should have the responsibility to societies as well as to your client who is paying your bills. Oh, I think... Uh, oh, sorry. Three here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. I was just going to say the bottom line is in Singapore, developers, it's how much profit they'll make. And it's very hard. As soon as you're involved in, you know, photovoltaics or, you know, active systems particularly, it's expensive. They won't go for it. <laughs> Uh, the added, in terms of sustainability, the attitude to persuade and persuasive power is very important of architects. It's very important. But um, besides that, I think the knowledge base, broad knowledge base to implement, which is necessary, required to implement a sustainable architecture, uh, is also very important. And also, um, besides that, the creativity you know, to uh, solve the, you know, the problem uh, faced in any situation is also very important. Uh, in terms of China, we talked about China. And um, if the China um, is taking a model, <laughs> Korean model, for example, one out of three people kind of uh, have a car, the world cannot be sustainable regardless of whatever and how much you know, the amount of our effort has been put you know, um, collectively, the world widely. So the, the persuasion uh, to persuade that uh, I think the, um, the Chinese government people and then let them have a very robust and very sound paradigms in making, creating the environment is very important, I think. You know, 
and uh, since they have a power, uh, they are not uh, as liberal as uh, in other Western countries yet. So it is that that part is uh, again like acting as a very good uh, the chance, you know, to make um, uh, the environment a very in an efficient way. And in Korean setting, you know, I think um, architecture had um, very uh, architect had. Um, uh, very difficulties in finding their role in the making our man-made environment until now because the government controlled everything. And, uh, but if, what I'm thinking is if architect is uh, very brave enough to persuade or very creative in solving, in, in suggesting the, you know, the uh, solutions, our, um, the building and our housing um, won't be like this. Like uh, we have already 5.3 million apartments right now. And then nothing has been considered uh, seriously about the sustainable issue. It's, it's just uh, amazing. And then architect, you know, and you also, um, how can I say, you also um, um, saying that um, the good building should be done by architect especially well trained, uh, you know, well trained in very good school like AA. You know, but what I'm thinking is, or I, have a, I, I will tell you some very interesting story. There were several people talking about, uh, and actually complaining about a house which is uh, designed by uh, one of the very famous architects. And then the users were tortured. And then they never complained, you know, out, Outside, you know, and they only talk about uh, that about you know their houses to their very close friend, because if they complaining, and the house price will be drastically, you know, the lower, <laughs> and then they yeah, <laughs> so I think the good uh, the 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 thing is the thing important thing is uh, designing the right building which has great value and which really satisfies users, you know, regardless of the who designed it. You know. Some people who are not trained uh, in architecture good school, they can really design a good building. And also, vice versa, you know, this a person who are really well trained in a good school can do very worst building also, which does not satisfy users at all. So. Um, and also in the cultural issue, the reason I didn't say anything is the cultural issue is very, um, very complicated. And then I wish I could speak English very well. And it requires, you know, tremendous ability to speak English very fluently to discuss about this seriously. When we say culture, we always saying that we are always relating the cultural issue to the tradition. And when people say, like uh, several years ago. Uh, people, the designers, a team of designers was saying that we are designing this village to restore our lost culture. And then the John Lang from the Australia, what he is saying is, the one you see right now is the Korean identity, Korean culture. Do you know what I mean? You don't have to restore, it is your culture, you know. So the cultural identity, we can say in the traditional perspective and also the current present perspective also. So it's a very, you know, requires very complicated discussion. And um, I have a lot to say, but uh, I have limitations. There's, there's, there's another chance tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you, you mentioned, you asked about what architecture is. I think architecture is a life setting creation. And the which, uh, uh, where all culture was so merged, um, so how can I say smeared into, and and also very intricately, uh, intricately intertwined. Um, I think I will talk. Thank you. Yeah. I think Don would like to yes. say very something brief. Briefly. Very brief. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the question you asked is very crucial, and um, about resourcing of the world is you know eliminating by our, us as a profession. But I think, look at from my standpoint, reality always have answer in itself. I think by the time the resource is used up, 
the new technology will help us to build the building more efficiently and use the resource, resource more wisely. Okay. Uh, but, but the thing is that I'm trying to draw the picture here. You know, I'm, I'm just, I read William Gibson things, and uh, there is the things about nanotechnology. You might think it's a fine fiction, but it's here already. And that nanotechnology will build the building exactly what it's meant to be. And you use the resource with the combination down to the atomic, you know, uh, combination of the material. So you don't end up wasting any single atom of your material in, in the building. So it, it sounds like a science fiction today, but you know, I, I believe 20 years from now it will be something very concrete. Okay, that's a bit technical belief. Uh, Paul, I think, is going to mind us with something historical. He's gazing at No, I was, I, was, no, I was just going to say I've enjoyed this conversation under your leadership, and thank you very much for that. It's been a, a, a good um, afternoon. And I think we owe Winston uh, a lot for bringing this conversation to sort of focus by saying that all, all these strands do actually come together, and, and surely they do. I think if you were traveling to this world from outer space and you, had, you were completely dispassionate about it, you would conclude that it was a, a wonderful place where you could settle, but first of all, a very, very serious virus had to be removed. And of course, that virus is us, and that's disturbing. In terms of um, who are our clients, I think our clients we can say the public, we can say building users, we can say people who pay, but I'd like to think that perhaps our clients are, are future generations, and future generations of the entire um, animal kingdom, not, not just ours. But I think that when it comes back to that Jeffrey Bauer quote and the value of this place, the value of schools of architecture, and I think from my perspective as well, the values of an institution. Why do you have a professional institution? What is a profession? Why do you have an RBA? Why do you have an AA? And I think that apart from acquiring skills and knowledge for which we owe the entire community much because we've all gained greatly from it, I think that we have the opportunity to develop our own architectural personalities, establish our values, but that process goes on through life and those values are defined and refined and they're reviewed and they're renewed. <coughs> and that's the importance of an ongoing engagement with education and the conversation. And I think few places do that better than this place. And it's really a great tribute to this place that you, all of you who speak such good English are willing to come so far to share a conversation like this here. And I think it's a memorable afternoon. Thank you very much. This, this is a, a very good point at which to stop because tomorrow we are going to have more exploration of these issues. And then tomorrow evening there will be another discussion to wrap up the two-day session. I think we've raised some very important issues this afternoon you can hold them in your brains until tomorrow and make sure that you bring them up again in other forms perhaps and push this discussion further. Thank you very much for all taking part in this discussion. We'll see you tomorrow morning at whatever time it's meant to be, 9, 9.30. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom. Oh. That for, for the participants, there is a dinner tonight. There for those who have said they are going to be taking part.